This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. I've mentioned it a few times on this podcast. I have been working on scripts, film scripts, for the last 18 months, two of them in particular. Now, if you're not from this world, and I'm definitely not from this world, a late bloomer, so to speak, you got to do a lot of homework, a lot of research, and YouTube is absolutely invaluable whether it's the famous directors, the famous screenwriters, the famous academics that know all about this world, YouTube is absolutely a godsend. And it's fascinating. We often don't think about the process of making a film, where it starts. It starts with the screenplay. It starts with the words. It starts with the writing. You have 120 pages. That's generally it. There's exceptions, of course, if you happen to be Tarantino or someone who might run over, like Aaron Sorkin, but generally it's 120 pages. And there are reasons for that. I will not discuss those right now in my intro of my guest today, but there are reasons. And they're fascinating. At least they're fascinating to me, and they're fascinating to a lot of Los Angeles, no doubt about it. My guest today is part of, comes from, my research into this screenplay writing process. Paul Galino. Paul is a professor at Chapman University in Orange County. Orange County, California, that would be. He believes deep in his bones, Hitchcock's adage, that films are made on paper. I never would have understood that statement. Never would have got that at all, if not for the last 18 months of my life. So in my process of figuring this puzzle out, I came across Paul. I asked him onto the podcast. He said yes. I hope you enjoy this because you know, it's not just about screenwriting. This is about story. Someone who has spent their life trying to figure out story. Why are we attracted to story? Paul's written multiple books about this, the science of screenwriting. I mean, he's dug into the details. There's a sort of neuroscience to this all. So whether or not you have an interest in writing a screenplay or not, that's not the point. To communicate, we all need story. We absolutely all need story. It affects us. It drives us. It is life. Without further delay, let's jump right into my conversation with Paul Galino of Chapman University. So listen, I'm going to keep you under an hour unless you get on some kind of a roll and you can't stop. I'm supposed to talk to a web developer in about 90 minutes, so I think we should have plenty of time. It's not live. My audio engineer will take any of our ums and ahs and whatever pause words we use out. And that's about it. And I'm just going to be very conversational with you and no crazy anything. Just jump right in. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I listened to your interview with Pinker. Fascinating. You did a great job. A little bit of my colleague, Vernon Smith. Ah, you know Vernon. Yeah, he's at Chapman University as well. I haven't had him over for dinner yet, but we hung out a little bit, that kind of stuff. Can I share with you, Vernon is one of the reasons this podcast got started. Because I had written these trading books, so I'm interviewing traders the first year. I had done a documentary, directed a documentary years back on the financial crisis of 2008. And in that, I was alum at that time. Vernon was teaching at George Mason University where I went. So I reached out to him. He said, sure, I'll do an interview with you. So I had him in that documentary. This podcast starts unfolding and I want to get Daniel Kahneman on. He wasn't responding. But I remember that him and Vernon had shared the Nobel Prize that year. So I went back to Vernon all those years later after the documentary and I said, Vernon, come on my podcast. He's like, sure. Great interview. Fun with him. Then I went back to Kahneman and I said, hey, would you like to come on my podcast? I had Vernon Smith on. I had Dan Ariely on. My first two non-traders. And Daniel writes me back and he goes, oh, I really liked your podcast with Vernon. I'll come on. 
Ah. <laughs> then it was almost impossible for people to say no once I was saying, well, Daniel Kahneman came on the podcast. <laughs> That's right. Now, I'm going to apply for a Nobel Prize uh, this year. I keep getting turned down. But I'm hoping maybe this will give me that last little bit that I need. <laughs> That's very cool. And what's amazing about Vernon, like he's just indestructible in terms of lifespan and intelligence. My gosh, the guy's the Energizer Bunny. Yes, yes. He's an inspiration. I have a couple of people that are, what he said, about around 90 or so, isn't he, I think? I have a colleague, I, well, a colleague, I guess, in the film business I work with who's 81 now, and he's like, okay, when's the next movie? Let's start. Let's get going. Ray funny. <laughs> <laughs> he's been doing it for 50 years. I say, well, if he's doing it at that age, I got hope. There you go, right? I told you where I'm calling you from, didn't I? Yes, you're in Vietnam. You're yeah, in Saigon? Yeah, 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 Saigon. Have you ever been? I've never been. You know what? I was in, of all places, I was in Shanghai in 1981. I was in grad school at the time working on a documentary for a fellow grad student. That's been my only trip to the Far East so far. Yeah, Shanghai was a very, rather different place, and Mao had been dead all of five years, and it was definitely, a for a, for a kid from America, from the suburbs, Actually, I was in New York at the time, so that was still a shock, though, going to Shanghai was a big deal. I haven't got down to Vietnam yet. How did you wind up there? You're from San Diego, is that it? I'm from the D.C. area, but I was in California. And quick story, I was hired by a Hong Kong bank to do a speaking tour four months across Asia. I had a two-week respite. I popped into Vietnam. Then when the tour was over, I said, I'm not leaving Asia. And I said, where did I have the most fun in four months? And Saigon was an easy choice. Really? And what made it fun? I was single at the time, and the ladies were very interesting. They're very alpha. It's not what people think or what people might imagine. Not the full metal jacket version. That version, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not the version. And then I think also there's a, there's a certain something. Maybe it's the Zen penetration of society. There's a certain something that just is inviting and approachable. And my gosh, I mean, here I am as an American, and I'm welcomed. I mean, come on. That's absurd on the face of it, but you are. It's amazing. It is interesting. Well, one thing that really struck me about Shanghai when I was there was that it was the first place I ever visited in my life in which there were battlefields that were within people's memory. There were pillboxes still and a lot of road intersections that the Chinese just didn't bother getting rid of. They just put flower pots on them and called them a, a public ornament. In Saigon, boy, that's within my lifetime. So is it scarred at all? That was one of the big surprises. That was the big surprise is the scars. I'm sure for the older generations are here, this population is, it's 100 million people, 50% below the age of 35. So they're all born after the war. Mm. It's a very interesting situation. So the obvious scars showing up as a tourist, for example, don't really appear there. That's fascinating. But, you know, this is a great place for us to jump into with my kind of opening question, because what you and I are both doing here, kindred storytelling spirits, is we're telling stories. Yeah. We're telling stories right off the bat, which is where I wanted to start with, which is like, you know, <laughs> what is it about stories? Because you not only are thinking about helping other people to think about story in the context of film, theater, stage. But you look at the science of story. Maybe that's a good place to kind of jump into. And I know this is, a, look, you've got a book on the science of, oh, the science right. of screenwriting. So, I mean, this is extremely dense stuff. But why don't we just see if we can kind of unpack something for the audience to kind of latch on to in terms of the science of story and why story is so important, big picture, to us human beings. The origin of the book, the inspiration was that there is, of course, I don't know, hundreds of books on screenwriting now out there. There's a tremendous interest in it. I have a colleague who says that Eskimos have 50 words for snow and there's like a thousand books on screenwriting. So therefore, screenwriting is what? A hundred times more important than snow. <laughs> <laughs> it strikes me that there is a lot of contradictory advice. How do you discern what's essential and what isn't? What's fashionable and what is essential? And also, of course, over the years one notices patterns in the storytelling, in the advice. Where does that come from? Is there a deeper origin than the fact that, oh, people just do it that way? I ran into, I worked with Professor Connie Shears, who's a psychologist at Chapman on a committee, typical academic meeting. And we started talking and decided to explore this issue in a collaboration. And ultimately, it makes sense to look at human physiology for the origin of the shape and the pattern of stories. 
The example I like to give originates with a New Yorker cartoon came out a few years ago. And imagine that there is a movie theater and every seat is filled by cats. Cats are everywhere. They're, cats are the audience. And on the screen is a close-up of a shoe with a shoelace that's loose. It's like, okay, that's what is interesting to a cat, but not so much for humans. To a cat, that's going to be interesting. To a human, what's going to be interesting? The basic lesson or takeaway from the book is that, let's take it in two ways. One is the question of why do we like stories or why are we drawn to stories? The most compelling argument that we found is this idea of stories as flight simulators of life, learning devices. They are a way of human beings to experience the life of somebody else who's making mistakes, who's getting in deep trouble, going through all kinds of danger. We learn from their experiences, but we ourselves are not in danger. And the flight simulator of life idea, which comes from a term coming from a psychologist, I'll find that for you, the idea that in a flight simulator, you can crash your plane and not die. In a movie, in a story, you can hear about somebody doing something wrong and maybe dying if it's a tragedy or maybe being wounded or being exposed to danger. And you learn about it without yourself being in danger. In fact, one writer, Jonathan Gottschall, he talks about even dreams. We talk about What's a dream? Dream is like, ah, peaceful. But dreams are never peaceful. Dreams tend to be about danger. They tend to be uh, iterations of challenges that we go through in our lives or that we may encounter. That helps us practice for when it happens to us for real. The Storytelling Animal is one of Gottschall's books. That would be the reason I would say the most persuasive argument I've heard for why we're drawn to stories. The way stories work has, I think, the most persuasive argument I've heard there. It draws on theories of constructivist psychology. And this is something that film scholar and theorist David Bordwell explored in the mid-80s in his book, Narration in the Fiction Film. And the basic idea is this, that when we experience life, this is something that we do discuss and give examples of in the book. When we go through life, we do a lot on faith. We seek clues. We don't have a brain that's capable of processing all the information that's out there. We have to do shortcuts. We have this thing called top-down and bottom-up processing. Bottom-up processing is we see something in the universe out there in the world. It goes through our senses, is transformed into memory. Okay, And it's stored there. Top-down processing happens when we see stimulus from the outside. It goes through our sense organs, into our brain, and it is compared, the new information, new data is compared to stored information. A shortcut is made. You've seen a curb on a street. You've experienced it once. When you see it again, you know how to navigate it because you've had curbs, you've seen it before. If a curb is significantly different in height from what you're used to, that's when you may stumble because you're making assumptions all the time. Now, how that works into story, and I think the joy of screenwriting, to me, the joy of screenwriting is getting into people's heads and messing around with them, is that you as a writer, as a screenwriter, and then by extension, a filmmaker, you are in charge of the clues that you're giving your audience. You can count on certain responses in the human beings that you're putting this out there for. You can count on the idea that they're going to look at clues and they're going to try to figure out where this is going. You know where it's going, and you know what clues to give them to get them to think it's going a certain way. Once you've got them anticipating, you can have all kinds of fun with them, surprise them in different ways. The art of the surprise twist is nothing other than it's telling two stories at the same time, the one the audience thinks it's seeing and the one it's actually seeing. You give them clues telling a certain story, and it can turn out to be, when you reveal something later, something else. The example I've given before is if you see a a movie and you see that there is a husband, he's buying flowers, fills out a little happy anniversary card for his wife. You see that. And then the filmmaker shows you the wife. She's waiting at home and she's got a gun and she puts the gun in a drawer by the bed on the nightstand and she's waiting for him. 
the audience knows where this is going. They know that he wants to make love and she wants to make war. That's based on experience, not only of life, but of other films that we've seen, all of which form part of our memory, our processed memory, the stored memory. We know that's where it's going. When it's revealed later that the guy is a gun collector and his wife loves him dearly and saved up all her money to buy him this one special gun, the gun that she's got, and is a present for him. Then it's suddenly, oh, wow, I didn't see that, but it makes sense. And then you reveal that the husband poisoned the candy that he bought for her. It's the opposite of what we thought. And we can tell that story and throw the audience off by doing nothing other than laying out certain clues for the audience understanding that they're going to come up with certain conclusions, hypotheses, and then you give them a surprise twist. That's how constructivist psychology works in terms of filmmaking. It's about giving the audience clues, visual and oral clues, that they will then process and anticipate where you're going. Screenwriting, filmmaking, and drama generally are obsessed with the future. You'll notice that Almost all novels are about the past. You have a narrator, and the narrator is telling you about stuff that already happened. Since the time of Greek drama, plays are written in the present tense. They're instructions for actors and art people, set people, about what to do to create something that's going to unfold right before the audience's eyes. Creating anticipation, focusing audience attention on the future, is central to the success of that enterprise. And this kind of understanding of how our mind works, if you have that tool, you know that it can help you realize what you want. Let me shift you into screenwriting and give a little setup for me too. I've spent the last 18 months immersed in two screenplays, one in particular for the last year really heavily. This is somebody who, like I said, I directed a documentary 10 years ago, but that's nothing like doing a screenplay. That's just completely child's play in many ways. Not necessarily, but go ahead. Yeah, of course. Ken Burns has done fantastic work. So yes, I want to take that back for a second. So someone like you doesn't just hit me over the head with a club and say, Michael, what are you talking about? But this process of getting inside a screenplay, you initially, as an outsider, as someone who's fresh, who's a novice, and like I said, there's been the 18 months of me working at it and being educated by folks like yourself on YouTube and whatnot. When you get into it, your first reaction is, okay, let me start thinking like a novel, or let me just start writing like a medium article or something. Then when you start to understand the conventions and the structure and the why of the conventions and the structure, oh my gosh, it's OCD, it's obsessive, you can't get out of it. Because then <laughs> once you know what the conventions and structure, why it exists, why the Coen brothers did No Country for Old Men like they did, you can see it on paper, then you can see it on screen. And then when you're in the middle of that, you no longer think about, well, okay, I want to write like a novel or a medium article. Now, what's so interesting is now that I'm immersed in this, and you'll relate to this way more than me, is that when I share the script with other people that perhaps have not read scripts, they can't get it really. They don't really know what it is because they want to read like a novel. And screenplays don't read like a novel. Yeah, they're a little bit different. Well, first of all, congratulations on plunging in and sticking with it 18 months. And as far as, let me just make a quick aside on documentaries. There are certain techniques that you'll see in these, and I haven't seen yours, but I did help out with a documentary recently. At least I gave notes to the director and writer of a documentary, The Ukrainian, The Invasion of Ukraine by the Russians a couple of years ago, four or five years ago now. And my notes were rather, in seeing a cut, were rather similar. They have to do with creating anticipation, creating expectations for the audience so that you can then pull us along in different ways. But getting back to this issue, there is a lot of advice. You're out there bombarded with it. And one, I guess you could say, I don't know if it's advantage or something unique maybe about my path into screenwriting is that it may be hard to believe, but when I first studied screenwriting, I thought actors actually wrote all their own lines. I'm only kidding. I, I didn't think that. There was like one book on screenwriting out there in the 70s, the late 70s. If you want, that's a good jumping off point because I was going to go back to your start. I want to know 
what was your trigger? What was your moment where you said, this is my path? It started in Super 8 Sound, well, actually Super 8 Film with Dad's camera making movies with friends, kind of like Spielberg did. We did our thing, and then after a while, just friends having fun. And then somebody told me after we did like a 40-minute film one summer and when I was in college, he said, well, you should take a course in filmmaking. I said, they teach courses in filmmaking? What are you talking about? I was at Columbia College at the time in New York City as an undergrad and found that that they did have filmmaking. I was shocked. In the process of studying at Columbia, I met someone named Frank Danielle, who was a Czech producer, writer, dramaturg, or teacher, who was the founding dean of the Prague Film Institute. Tom the name is still there. He was a very influential teacher. He's the one who taught me the ropes. As I say, he was an influential teacher. His students that you would recognize included Milos Forman, Ivan Passer, Terence Malik, David Lynch, Martin Brest. There's a lot of filmmakers whose lives he influenced. As an aside, to listen to David Lynch is absolutely fascinating. I could listen to him all day long for weeks. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Frank Danielle, what's funny about Frank Danielle, he had a unique approach to teaching the craft. Again, it was before there was Sid Field. I think Sid Field came out the year before I, the year I started studying with Frank Danielle. We had a uh, recently a group of former students of Frank's. He died 23 years ago. Former students, including some from Czechoslovakia, including Ivan Passer was their director. One of them, Melina Jelinek, one of his students from Czechoslovakia, made the observation that here we are, about a dozen former students who are now teachers at USC in different places. And none of us can really quite define what it was that Frank Danielle taught. <laughs> what He didn't leave a book. He left a book on European drama in Czech. He wrote screenplays. He won an Academy Award. He was a producer of The Shop on Main Street, a Czech film. He wrote for American television for a while. He was the founding director of the American Film Institute. But he didn't leave a specific body of theory. What was the most important thing that he gave you? Let me explain what he told us about how he learned. He said he and his friends would go into the movie theater in Czechoslovakia. I guess this would be in the 40s and 50s. And they would get there in the morning and watch the same movie five times all day and then they leave. He just learned from watching movies. He learned from studying European drama. When he was teaching us, the attitude of him as a teacher was as a collaborator. He was not, when I studied with him, both theory and also in the workshops. The worst note that you would get from him, you'd read something in class and he'd he'd give notes. All right, sometimes it didn't go so well. But the worst thing you could hear was, there'd be a pause and he'd say, I think we are in trouble. (laughs) And, And you'll notice he didn't say, you're in trouble, or this doesn't work, or you better fix this. It was we're in trouble. He was your collaborator. And there would never be a criticism without about two or three suggestions. And then he would blend that off into theory. Okay, so this, you can use this technique. My impression of him was that he taught more like tools than rules. He didn't like the idea of rules. But if you understand different strategies for writing a screenplay as tools, then it frees you up to be creative in how you affect an audience. And he certainly, when he analyzed movies, it wasn't always the ones that fit neatly in our what we consider a Hollywood blockbuster. It was art films. And at the time, Bergman, Fellini, Boonwell, in addition to classical Hollywood. So he had a command of all of it. I'll tell you the first thing that I have my notes from the very first class, he told us what I told you earlier about constructivist psychology. He said that your job is to turn audiences into keen observers of detail. Make them the smartest people in the world. And this is early on when he's saying, this is a visual medium and you're gonna describe actions and you're gonna describe characters doing things. And from those actions, use of props, costumes, whatever, you're gonna give us clues and the clues are gonna get the audience thinking where it's going. And then once you've got them anticipating it, where you're going, then you've got them and you can have fun with them. I studied with Frank for a couple of years, and then went out there and did what writers do. I was in New York. I wrote at night, worked at Showtime during the day, did some script reading for Showtime. I did some stage work in New York, and eventually 
moved out to Los Angeles, was able to connect with an agent. By that time, I was writing scripts that were at least getting me read, recognized. There were a couple of competitions back then. There were nothing like today, but there were a few things. Then connected with an agent who was able to get me a deal. I mean, it was a classic. He got me a deal. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Usually you go find your own and then you get an agent, but he figured it out. Then had another one, hooked up with a, another producer, did some more writing. But I always, because I was inspired by Frank Danielle, I always wanted to teach because I had a great role model, but I felt I shouldn't teach unless I've had something done because then I can say, yeah, it worked. And then I realized, oh, I have had a couple of movies done. And I wound up, I had some friends at USC who invited me to start teaching there. So I started teaching there in the 90s and then was invited to teach at Chapman in the late 90s. And that's where I've been ever since. Over the years, I've continued to write, of course, refine the teaching based on a lot of classroom experiences. In the book, Science of Screenwriting, made an attempt to examine even some of Frank Danielle's ideas in light of the scientific human physiology, human psychology and physiology. As I say, the opening lecture he talked, he gave to us aligned with David Bordwell's theory on narration in the fiction film very nicely. That came, that was about six years, that came out six years after Frank Danielle, I learned it from Frank Danielle. So he, Bordwell formalized it. But Danielle was the inspiration for me to learn and grow and understand screenwriting in that way. And he would also say that you can only really learn filmmaking from the masters because they did it. His analysis class was all about looking at feature films and understanding, taking them apart and seeing the way his analogy was, get into the kitchen of the master chef and find out what their recipe was, how they delivered this. And then he would come to some general concepts and then convey those to you. There were concepts. It was more in my first book, Sequence Approach. That one is a lot of Frank Danielle's theory laid out. And most of the book is analyses of feature films, a series of feature films, drawing out the techniques that Danielle would talk about. Examples would be like one of my pet peeves now for the, a lot of the movies I see is the notion of a recapitulation scene. What is a recapitulation scene? Well, you'll see them in classic, well-constructed movies. It's basically two characters talking to each other in which they review what's happened and create anticipation for what's about to happen. What that does is it keeps us oriented, of course, but it also allows us to maintain our position as participants in a drama rather than observers. And you want to turn the audience into participants. For example, of uh, that, I analyzed Toy Story in my first book, I think of the well-made movie. You have a moment where Woody and Buzz are arguing and right in the middle of the story, Woody lays out the situation. You came along, you ruined everything. Now he's going to leave and Andy's going to leave, move in five days and we're lost and et cetera, et cetera. So we're oriented and now we know what the next task has to be. They got to figure out how to get back to Andy's place. Meanwhile, like for example, I don't know if you're familiar with Stranger Things. It's a Netflix series that has been very successful. And it actually is the creators and the writer directors are two students who took one of my classes. <laughs> I'd like to say I'm responsible for their success, but I studied with some other people too at Chapman, some very good people. But I noticed that, man, they could use some recapitulation scenes. Are you familiar with that series at all? I'm not. I'm not. Okay. That's okay. We're in an age, in this wonderful age, where there's so much material that you can watch a series that is award-winning and people not only not seen it, but they've never heard of it. That's great. I love this blossoming of creativity. Anyway, it's a fascinating series involving supernatural and set in the 80s and there is a the government is working on things. But there are these kind of action moments where if they would just tell us what the objective of the characters are in this next sequence, we would much more appreciate what's happening rather than 
just watching the character do a bunch of stuff. And at the end, we find out what they were trying to do. But that's a specific example of, okay. I'm thinking of a great example. You might laugh at me, but I think it's such a good example of what you're talking about right now about building clues. And it's almost like the movie was a movie about building clues, which is the first hangover. It was all about clues and clues and clues. And as an audience member, you just want to follow along because you had no idea where it was going. Right. What's interesting is that, let's say another thing that's central to storytelling which goes back to Aristotle, and certainly Frank Daniel discussed Aristotle too, this idea of cause and effect. Not a bunch of things that happen. It's not, in Danielle's terms, just one scene after another is like beads on a string that just one thing after another. It's cause and effect, and it's punctuated. We, as human beings, respond. We're constantly looking for cause and effect. Connie Shears gives the example, my co-writer gives the example, that, that if a dog, as much as I love dogs, if a dog comes across a pile of food, they're just going to eat it. They're not going to try to figure out where it came from. They're just going to eat it. A human being is going to look at that pile of food and say, what caused that to be there? That helps us survive. It's all about evolution. You had, uh, I listened to your talk with, with Professor Pinker about evolutionary psychology. Well, that would be an example. It's an advantage to be able to figure out where stuff came from. And that's what we're like as human beings. So you can take advantage of that in movies. First of all, you have to, we want to see that. We want to see where the cause and effect is. But even when it's out of order, like the hangover, we're going to want to piece it together. Believe it or not, uh, in terms of narrative and what story is, we exist temporally, we exist in time. In a way, all the objects that we encounter, we work backwards. If you see a building, you walk along the street, unconsciously, you're aware of the fact that somebody built that, that there's a story behind that building, that the building isn't just a blank thing, it's a story. You're seeing it out of order, you're seeing it at the end, but you understand it. And so a movie like The Social Network, which is all fragmented at the end, it's a deposition, there's flashback, how do we make sense of it? Well, we have a propensity to put it in terms of cause and effect, and that if the story satisfies that, we understand it, then it's going to work for us. So yes, the hangover, they give us a bunch of outrageous clues, which has an extra function of making us curious. You have this puzzle. That's something else that you'll see in the beginning of movies. Often they begin with some kind of puzzle if they draw you in. We're curious. What is that strange thing we see? Why is that character doing something funny, strange, unusual? You give us a puzzle, we're going to tune in because we have these frontal lobes that churn and that we work over, we think about things and come up with conclusions. In the science of screenwriting, I give an example, and this has to do with exposition. How do you convey information to the audience? We don't respond well to information dumps. We don't respond well to somebody getting up there and saying all this background information. We need it in digestible bits. A great example that Connie gives is a recipe. How many people read a recipe once and then go off and cook something? Never. I never did. I got to look back every three seconds and see what is it I do next? Because there's no narrative, there's no context. It's very hard for us. So what filmmakers, successful filmmakers do is, yeah, they will play games. They'll give you clues, make us hungry for the information. So when we get it, it's satisfying. The example I gave is from a classic 1939 film, Ninochka. What happens? It starts in Paris, and you have this decrepit-looking gentleman walk into this really fancy hotel and look around and say nothing. And the maitre d' comes over and says, can I help you? And he's like, no, 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 I don't want any help. And he disappears. A moment later, another decrepit-looking guy comes in and looks around. And the maitre d' is like, going on here? He goes up to him and says, oh, can I help you? No, no, I don't want to be helped. And then a third guy comes and there's like a rotating door, whatever my brain is going. But what do you call the... I don't know, the revolving door? Revolving door, that's it. Your sound man's going to make me sound much smarter than I am. <laughs> but then a third guy, he doesn't even leave the revolving door. He just looks and goes back and you get a reaction from the maitre d'. Well, it's about a minute, maybe a minute and a half. I want to know what's going on. It's incongruous. You've got what Frank Danielle would call garlic in your coffee. Something is not adding up here. So you've got these three guys, and now I'll give the filmmaker a few more minutes because I want to find out what's going on. And then you find out that they're, they're three Russian envoys. Then they have an argument. And in the argument, we gradually learn, as if we're overhearing them, information about their mission, why they're in Paris, and what they're going to be trying to do. It's rather like the mechanism in The Hangover, where you've got 
these weird clues, things that don't fit. What was it a leopard, perhaps? I think it was a, some kind of big cat. It was Mike Tyson's tiger. Tiger. Okay, it was a tiger there. Right. And we want to know what happened. But when it comes to conveying information to the audience, it's like this. Exposition is learning. Learning makes cognitive demands on us. It's like swallow your medicine. But if you don't learn, you're not going to appreciate the story. In other words, each story carries an emotional payload. It's a mechanism for delivering an emotional hit. But in order to get the hit, you need to make an investment, cognitive investment in learning stuff. And the job of the screenwriter, filmmaker, if you want to connect with that audience, if you don't want to, forget it, it doesn't matter. But if you want to connect with an audience, you got to be careful about how you make that information go down as easy as possible. Best when they have no idea that they're getting information. They think they're watching the story. Let me keep you at something that I saw through your work and you quoted, and I had not seen this quote before, but Hitchcock saying that films are made on paper. So here you are talking about all these various issues, and I have just a wee bit of experience to relate to it because as I'm thinking about the Hitchcock comment, films are made on paper, and I'm thinking about the various issues you're talking about. I'm thinking about the constraints of a screenplay, typically 120 pages, certain conventions inside those 120 pages. Boy, we're not even to the point. There's the film you write, the film you shoot, the film you edit. We're at the point of the film that you write. I don't think enough of us truly appreciate when we see that great film that it did start on paper and that that work on the paper is, oh my gosh, it can be terribly fun, but it's terribly difficult. It requires intense Intense, intense, intense amount of work, collaboration, revision, editing. Again, as Hitchcock says, it starts on the paper. The guy who wrote Psycho, he came to Chapman once and he gave a talk and I got to talk to him. And he told this story about writing Psycho. Hitchcock was not a writer. He didn't take credit for the writing, but he was certainly a collaborator with his writers. And he said that they worked on Psycho, on the script for Psycho, then at the end, the last day they were just meeting with the producer to tie up a few loose ends. He noticed that Hitchcock seemed very depressed. The writer thought, oh my God, something, he asked, is something wrong? Hitchcock said, no, the script is perfect. Now I got to go shoot it. He said, the movie's done. Now I got to go shoot it. <laughs> so that's the attitude that he had. Yes, you can solve, you couldn't solve everything on paper, but pretty close. It is a tremendous amount of work. One thing that is worth talking about, it's a Frank Daniel observation in the years since I found that you can channel Edgar Allan Poe when you talk about it. Frank Daniel used to say that a script is written backwards, that it's written, first you do a draft, and then when you get to the end, that moment of emotional payoff, the payload that you want to deliver, you're going to know where you want to wind up. Once you know where you want to wind up, you can go back and revise. That is where you set things up. And you write it backwards, in effect. You set up everything so that it supports that emotional impact. Where Edgar Allan Poe comes in is that he actually had a concept called the unity of effect. He wrote a review of Hawthorne's Twice Told Tales. And in it, he put forward this idea of unity of effect. Well, what is that? He said the unity of effect, and this applied in the essay to short stories, which means something that you consume in one sitting. You sit down, you read the short story. That's it. It's not like a novel. So he talked about short stories. Unity of effect is an attempt to answer the question that's so basic most storytellers would never even think of it, which is what's the principle you appeal to that determines what should stay in your short story and what should be cut out? And his answer was, you start at the end. You start, what is the emotional impact I want to have? That effect. You start with the effect and then go back and everything that supports that effect that you want to achieve, you keep in and everything that's neutral or has nothing to do with it, you take out. What happened is that that idea gets picked up in theater during the 19th century. You can see it in Brander Matthews, who was a Columbia professor and a dramatist. He had the same idea. And it applied to theater because just like a short story or a short poem, which also was something that Poe was talking about, you consume it in one sitting. That gets picked up through short stories who were the big screenwriters, the big paid screenwriters in the 19 teens were the short story writers. And then the playwrights come in, in in the late 20s with the talkies. So that affected American cinema. So this 
idea that you're talking about how complex the screenplay can be. It is because there's a lot of supporting stuff that you can do in it to make it work. But it helps if you understand that, sure, throw it on the page, the first draft, and then figure it out. What is that effect? And then you work backwards to see what is it that's going to help you get there. What character could be introduced here or there? And you make notes as you go. I happen to be working on a script right now for a director and supposed to be a polish, but it's turning out to be more like a rewrite. There's like a, oh, that'd be great if this character had this particular prop, but it'd be stronger if that prop was introduced earlier. And then this character arriving at this time, getting, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, so you make a note, and then in the rewrite revision of the revision, you go back and you put it in. And then it gives the movie a sense of unity, a sense of force and power if it's embroidered with motifs, things that are planted, paid off, characters that are introduced a certain way, and then that's paid off. It's a profound effect. How do you feel sometimes when you mention the screenwriting that you're working on right now, sometimes those little joys that you might find Saturday afternoon, you're working on your screenplay and something you solve in the writing or you figure out something that's really interesting and it just makes you feel so good. It's a release. But it's so intellectual. It might be small to the rest of the world, but to you, it's so big and it's so interesting and it feels so good, but you can't really share it because the context of what you're in the middle of is too hard to explain. (laughs) Right, right. Well, it's funny that, I mean, obviously you just enjoy what you can. There was one project I did that I had a solution to that, but life is complicated. It didn't quite work. I was involved in an animated feature. It was a big studio type feature. They have a lot of story teams that come in. And I was the sixth writer out of eight that was brought in on this project. I saw through it. I did a draft and a rewrite for them before I got replaced. But I was hoping there were some really cool adventures in the creation of this script. I wish I could give details, but it was one of these non-disclosure agreements. I can't really spill what happened in it. My hope was that I could write a book about that experience. And take apart the script. It actually never wound up getting made. But the answer to your question is you can always hope that it'll get made, it'll be successful, and then you can write a book that'll relay all the details about how it came to be. And that's about it. <laughs> but We've only got so much time unless you keep running and you don't want to stop. You probably have things you got to do out there. And you're in LA, right? Chapman's in LA. Chapman is in Orange County and I'm in Santa Monica. Okay, gotcha. I'm fine. One of the things that you've got a book about this too, but it's really interesting and it was so striking to me. I had no concept or clue. The sequence approach. And the why, the sequence approach, going back to something, here we are, we've already know we've got this three-act structure. We've talked about 120 pages, typically 30 pages in the first act, 60 pages, and then 30 more pages on the final third act. But there's an old-time kind of technical explanation that goes along with this, which you can explain much better than me, but oh my gosh, so interesting. It's funny how it's come back in its own way. The basic story is this, the origin of it was that when cinema was stabilized in the one reeler, about 10-minute reels, by the first decade of the 20th century, when you go to the cinema, you pay a nickel and you go in and you watch a 10-minute feature. The featured presentation might be a, some famous comedian doing something. And they were 10-minute experiences. Starting around 1912, 13, around there, basically Hollywood wanted to get the middle class in that theater. And the middle class was watching stage plays. And you can't do Hamlet in 10 minutes. You could do highlights, and they did. But you can't do the whole thing. You can't do it justice. It was the original example of supersizing. They figured if we get them to pay a nickel for a 10-minute movie, a series of 10-minute movies, maybe we get 50 cents, we'll get them for the whole evening. They started expanding beyond one reel. But in America especially, the distribution system was very rigorously one reel per week. You would get the distribution companies would send the theaters a reel a week, a different one. So they changed the program once a week. So the first features tended to be distributed that way. You would have a feature film, let's say five reeler, and it would go out across five weeks. So it was really a limited series. In order to keep the audience hooked, You could actually see it, there were instruction manuals at the time, where you try to come up with some kind of climax for each reel. So it was writing by the reels. There was that 
fact of the distribution system and also the fact that you have one projector in these theaters. So you'd have to pause between reels. The idea was each reel has its own integrity and built up to the next one and to the next one. You also had at the time by 1912, the first serials that were one reel per week. And those would have a continuing story, but those would also have each reel had to have its own integrity and tell a story. And then eventually they were standardized at two reels by the mid-teens. From that origin comes a certain discipline in writing those scenarios or continuity scripts, what they were called at the time. And it persisted into the sound period, into the 20s, where you'll still see that there are screenplays, uh, continuity scripts that are marked by sequence letter, A, B, C, D, etc. And by then, the meaning of them is not as rigorous as the real thing, but it's still there. It affected how American storytelling worked in cinema for the better, because each reel is an engine that pushes this narrative forward. It's like you have eight engines, two reels in the first act, four in the second, two in the third. What happened is that this fell out of use, but in the 80s and 70s, Frank Danielle, again, noticed he was a teacher at the American Film Institute, and he taught at Columbia, and then he later went to USC. He noticed that students were struggling with the second act. He did teach us three-act structure from the first day. That was his approach. There's various reasons for that. But he thought, well, if we bring back the sequence approach, then it'll help the students develop that story in that second act. And suddenly, instead of wondering, how am I going to fill up 60 pages? It's like, no, you don't have to worry about that. Just figure out what the character is going to do for the next 10 minutes. OK, that's all you worry about. And they try something. But is there a science to the 10 minutes or is that just something we've been conditioned to based on the history you've described? I think that you could argue that there is a scientific basis to it. It would be this, that there's a couple of things happening here. One is that we have a chapter in the book devoted to the science of contrast. Movies, they live or die with contrast. And that's something else I think Frank Danielle said. He anticipated a lot of this science. Maybe he was from the future. I don't know. That he knew this stuff, that you'll see an alternation between light and dark, loud and soft, fast and slow. There's also tension and release. If you try to maintain tension in the audience for too long, the audience tunes out. They get numb. So you need to set it up, release it, set it up, release it. You play the audience like that. Danielle would call it punctuation. Connie Shears would, would talked about it more like it's resetting the brain. The brain needs to be reset periodically so it doesn't get fatigued. There is something called neuronal adaptation where you can even test it. You can see for yourself your perceptual organs processes will filter out stimulus that's at the same level all the time because your brain has to filter it out because it's not important. It focuses not on the, the grass that's waving, you know, in the breeze. It focuses on a pattern of rapid change where there's a tiger. Zach Galifianak is standing exactly. in the toilet, <laughs> taking a leak, looking over at a tiger staring at him. <laughs> right. You notice that. That's different. The physiology would be this, that a sequence of, let's say, 15 minutes, is going to be like, if we talk about the feature script, three-act structure, the first act you set up in the paradigm. There's variations, but let's go with that. The paradigm would be, first act, we introduce who story it is, what he or she wants, what the obstacles are going to be. When we know that, then the second act begins, because the character is going to try to get it. And that generates tension in the audience, because if we connect to that character, we can actually, our emotions blend right into the character. There's a theory, again, in the book of blurring, where we actually identify so closely with another person that we become the person. We experience what they're going through. If that connection is achieved, then we're emotionally involved in their attempt to get what they want. That's why we love a Tony Soprano right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other cool thing is that I dislike the term hero. I'm not judging the hero's journey. That's another theory out there. But I don't like the word hero because when students hear that, they think they got to have somebody who's heroic. That's not actually what Vogler means. And it's not the best approach. You want someone who's got problems and who's flawed because they're going to learn something and we're going to learn something from them. And they're interesting. Anyway, the tension that you create in that second act, that's why we tune in. We want to see whether they're going to get what they want. And the third act is a resolution of that. Okay, that's one line of tension. But if you try to sustain that, let's say it's a tennis game 
analogy I use. You got your best friend is playing mortgage their house on a tennis game uh, against a hustler, and you're watching this thing, and you're gonna hoping that he's gonna win, afraid he's gonna lose. But if you try to do that tennis game for an hour, we're gonna tune out. It's not interesting enough. Not that it's not interesting. It's just that that line of tension will become numbing after a while. So it needs to be varied. So the sequence approach would be that the first thing the character does to try to solve the problem. They attempt, and that'll create a little suspense around that. And at the end of the first sequence, let's say 15 minutes, you resolve it, usually in the negative, because if the character gets the objective, then your movie's over. So it fails. Now, in that time, you've created tension and release, and now you build up to the next one. You get tension and release, and tension and release. And you can do it as it is. You can do it any number of times, actually, in a movie. In a longer movie, you'll see it like Lawrence of Arabia will have 16 sequences rather than eight. And some movies have nine, some have seven. It varies. The physiology of that would be, has to do with human attention. Now, within the sequences, of course, you'll have scenes. Our ability to focus on one stimulus lasts about three to five minutes. That's it. We can focus for that long, then we need a break. We need something to change up, something to switch, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a coincidence, I think, that most dramatic scenes defined as a location with certain characters doing something, they last about three minutes before you have a change of location, a change of characters, something else intervening. So you have these little tensions, three-minute bursts that help the audience digest it. Then you put a couple of those together. Let's say you set up attention of a sequence in about five minutes. Then it's got about five more minutes to develop the tension and five more to release. The sequences would seem, can't prove it, they would seem to be consistent with that rule of thumb about our attention span being three to five minutes. They have the advantage in story development in helping you really explore a premise that if a character tries to get something and they fail, then they have to try the next more difficult thing. And then that fails, then you can switch it up with something else. And so you really explore a premise fully. You don't get a one trick pony. Yeah, it's not one thing. You're going to see a lot of variations. Sequences help solve another problem that filmmakers and screenwriters have. I blend the two terms, which is that audiences know that the movie is a contrivance. It's a contrivance, okay, that there is no accidents in it. There's no coincidences. You're the filmmaker and you're in charge of everything. But it doesn't work if it feels like a contrivance. You have to persuade people that anything could happen. And if you have in that second act the character trying something and failing, and they maybe they almost succeed and then they fail. Then they almost succeed again and they fail. You're giving us glimpses of alternative endings. So it really gives that impression that anything could happen. And it almost did. So you often see right in the middle of a movie, a well-made film, that it seems like the story's going to be over. And then something else happens. But we're given a plausible ending. And then you wind up, end of the second act, you have what usually is the contrast between that and the resolution. In that writing process, though, you can sit down perhaps with your big picture idea, you can sit down with your outline, but not until you get into the writing do you necessarily see where those tries and fails could fit or you could imagine them. There's this weird thing that starts to take place in the writing where it's like, I don't know how many writers, I mean, I've heard Tarantino talk a little bit about this, but when you sit down with the blank page, you really can't imagine the full 120 pages. It's almost just, you've got to start, you've got to work at it, noodle at it, and then then things are going to happen. You put it aside for a while, something else happens. It's a fascinating process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, in terms of that blank page, there's a couple ideas to share. You could see now, I would want to pick your mind now for days, right? <laughs> right. Well, it's a lot of fun. You're terrific at this, obviously. So it's very enjoyable. And it's what I love. I love doing this stuff. I'll tell you a little story about this idea. Maybe it's a God complex, but I think the appeal of being a screenwriter with all its frustrations is that you get to be God because you have this created world and this created characters and you see them struggle and you, you can have pity on them, but they're going to be in pain and yet they're your people, you know? Okay, so in one way, you're like God. But the other way is that when I had my first film produced, 
when I was writing this based on a real story kind of crime drama, I had a female lead. She has an entrance and an entrance of a character. That's first impressions. That's important. So I wanted to do it with a little flair. So I figured, okay, she comes in through these French doors and the curtains blow in the wind. So I did that, wrote that. I'm sitting in a maid's room in an air shaft in New York City, writing this, writing it on the blank page. What was it a year, a year and a half, two years later, I went out to the set. I got it, things sold. And I went out to the set and it was like a whole army of workers had constructed on the soundstage all the locations that I had conceived in my screenplay in that maid's room, they were all there. And it's like, I'm off to one side. I saw the French doors. I said, I wrote French doors and an army of <laughs> carpenters got to work and they made these French doors. It's like the word spoke and the universe leapt into existence. I mean, that was pretty heady. There's a couple of things that doesn't bear directly on what you're saying. Well, maybe it does. I think there's two ways of learning screenwriting and I call them the avalanche approach and the ambush approach. And I was blessed by being given the ambush approach. Ambush approach is that you have a mentor, do the creativity, and they help you. Avalanche approach is that you read a lot of theory, which I consider an avalanche of information, and then try to create. <laughs> and that's really hard. It's hard to do that because the creative process, it's unstructured. It's emotional, emotion-driven. It's You have to daydream. One way to think about it, I'll lean on Frank one more time in this respect. He talked about this as the you have your critical side of your brain and the creative side. A story is a structured daydream, but a daydream has to come first. It has to be unstructured, free-flowing, pour it on the page. Then after it's on the page, you can apply different theory, so to speak. Okay, And the problem of writer's block happens when somebody is on the first stage where it's just flowing freely and they're already criticizing everything. So maybe that's what you're referring to when how can you keep in mind the overall structure if you're just trying to create something that's alive. And that's very valid. And the solution is like what I do is just complain. Like if I'm stuck, you just start typing right on the page. First, you get the music going, whatever turns you on to get you into your emotions. And you just start typing and saying, why can't I write this damn script? I hate it. Everything's wrong, you know, et cetera. Start typing that. Type it for a page. And by the end of a page, you'll be in because you disarm that critical side and you're just flowing again, you're just letting it on the page, letting it live. Then afterward, you can start to relate to structure. I have no idea if what I'm doing will turn out to be good, useful, all that kind of fun stuff. But I can say what I've learned so far in terms of the writing, I mean, I've written books, but having the personal experience deeply embedded in me as the foundation of where I was going to go on a screenplay was so easy for me in a way. I mean, because I kind of had this interesting personal experience and I've now heard kind of like how I found you, but I've now heard so many directors talk about this now, and, and I might not have noticed it before I went down the path of taking personal experience and weaving that into a screenplay, but so many directors now, who's the guy that does the Grand Budapest? He was talking about this the other day. He said, almost every one of my characters, he makes these crazy movies. He says, every one of my characters is somebody I knew. You know, and you're like, oh my gosh. And even Tarantino, Tarantino says, Kill Bill is personal to me. What? <laughs> <laughs> and he says it's personal because what he did is he took the emotional experience and then fictionalized it to those characters. And I just find that fascinating. Right. Well, it helps. The first exercises that I do with students in the beginning is I have them write it one a week, a character profile of someone they know who has a particular characteristic. Who is the most ambitious person you know? Write it out. Don't worry about story. Just write that out and let me know. Give me specifics. I want specifics. What tells you about that? Who is the most spiritual person you know? Who is the biggest liar you know? Inevitably, I know when they've just made it up and when they've got somebody that they based it on. Because the ones that are based on a real person are always more specific and much more interesting, a lot more fun. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing some of the things. And they're in your life. And in fact, the first script that I sold was based on a cop that I happened to know that I met. So I, there was your model. And I get down to specifics. But, well, he didn't like the way a Glock looked. So he but this point you're bringing up is interesting because this gets at something that I think, I imagine, okay, here you are, you're teaching, you've got all these young skulls of mush in front of you. 
it's got to be an interesting thing for as you teach, because you look at all these young folks that are very eager. I'm 50. OK, you know, so I'm not a babe in the woods anymore. I've been around the block, so to speak. But that being around the block gives you uh, color. It gives you something a little uh, pizzazz, a little jazz. Whereas I think if you're younger and you haven't had a chance to do all kinds of crazy experiences, perhaps like go to Shanghai and see the grave sites still there. Those things are invaluable. I almost would say I'm not exactly a professor of screenwriting, but I would almost want to tell screenwriting students go live first, you know? Right. Oh, no, that's definitely true. And it's a hard lesson for them to hear, but it gives them hope. I mean, when you make it straight out of school, your experiences are school and the industry. (laughs) I think they hear a story like a Tarantino story, you know, mid 20s. But I think if you dig into a Tarantino story, the guy was like an OCD guy watching thousands of movies. So he was getting this crazy education. And you can see that it's been sprinkled across his work. Right, right, right. There's a quote by Amy Pruex. I think her name is the one who did Brokeback Mountain. I think I'm pronouncing her name right. She said it's I think that's important to know how the water has gone over the dam before you start to describe it. It helps to have been over the dam yourself. (laughs) Right, right. Here's a crazy example. This is just a rough draft work in process log line. A wealthy author detoured to an Asian country, one where his government killed millions, meets an enigmatic force that shatters faith in the American dream. Now, that's clearly something you can't just pick up at 20. I couldn't have picked that up at 20. Right. Uh, You've got to go find that somewhere. I don't know where, but you've got to go find it. You live your life and then you keep going with it, keep writing things down and inspirations, whatever you come across. And yes, and then after a certain point, wisdom does set in. You can tell. I mean, I've been trying a little bit of collaboration with students in terms of developing web series, because I think this is a, we talk about the sequence approach. Well, something old is new. When you have something like Quibi, I don't know if you're following this new concept that Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman are, have started a company called Quibi, which stands for Quick Bites. And they want to create the Game of Thrones that people will watch on their cell phones in 8 to 15 minute episodes. They want to create little episodes. Right back to your sequence approach, huh? Right. Suddenly it's like, yeah, because now you've got all these options. You can make a feature film, but... Write it in sequences. Now you've got an eight-part limited web series, or you've got a feature. We're back to the early 1900s. Right. And it's a proven model. They're actually onto something. But I'm working on this thing with students, and I realize we're trying to come up with a story that takes place over several episodes, like five, six-minute episodes. They are very good at writing kids their age. If I assign them, okay, write a, a professor or an adult or a cop. They really don't know how it all works. They're just relying on movies. And that's that's their age, and there are limitations. One thing I did take away from Frank Danielle was a way of looking at the world that I didn't have before. That was through the prism of drama. And that's something that a 20-year-old can use when they're 50 or 60. And it's something you just start to see where the drama is in people all your life. If you keep at it and keep doing it, then gradually your stuff will get better. I think even you'll know, as you do it a few times, you'll know when you say, well, start with a blank screen, do you know how the script would be developed? I can tell with my students now whether they have a half hour idea or a 45 minute idea or how long it will take them roughly to do that sequence. That's not enough for one or that could be, it just comes with practice. It's like, yeah, I think that would be cool. You also develop a sense of how to develop the story in a way that maximizes the really cool scenes. As I like to say that uh, all these structure notes you get from different books and sequence approach or the three acts or eight acts or whatever you want to call it, all that is is delivery systems for really cool scenes. Because when you see a movie, again, going to constructivist psychology, you don't actually see a story when you watch a movie. You don't. You see scenes. (laughs) That's it. You see scenes. The audience watching the scenes pieces together a narrative in their mind. But the story is never materially present. It only exists in the audience's mind. You start to realize when you have an inspiration or you're working with someone who wants to develop a story, since scenes are all the audience sees, the best way to develop a story is the way that maximizes all the really cool scenes. Again, the script I'm working on, I'm rewriting now. It's like, okay, you have a fish out of water situation. 
I can come up with three other examples of that that would be much cooler than what's there. So that's how I'm going to develop this thing. Oh, you got this here. You overlooked this possibility. This is going to be really cool if you do it this way. And that's all practice. As to wisdom and where stories are, what is it like? Can you do a, a really searching, meaningful story at 20? That'd be pretty tough. <laughs> I have one last, because I've kept you for a lot longer than I promised, but I have one last kind of question, thought, and I'm curious where you might go with it. Here we have all these brilliant people around the world, very smart people, uh, writers, uh, directors, editors, cinematographers. My question is, is how come I can't get not duplicates of what I'm about to tell you. I don't want replications of these movies, but how come I can't get at least a Birdman or a Godfather or a No Country for Old Men or a Silence of the Lambs? How come I can't get at least one of those every year? Or are we getting them and I just don't see them? Well, I go back to this discussion about when I analyze movies for students, there's a period in Hollywood history and it all happened by accident because the only thing I was ever interested in was making money. As a byproduct of that drive for money, you have this period from the late 30s into the 50s, which is an outpouring of incredible number of really time-tested, wonderful movies. It's almost bizarre how well-crafted those are. Then it goes away. Now we have superhero movies. Now we have superhero <laughs> movies. And what happened there? Well, man, I, I'm sorry if this is more or less than Frank Danielle, but I talked to him once about this. This is 1980. I talked to him about this one particular movie that I had seen, and I thought, it was Popeye. It was Robin Williams and Popeye. I thought it'd be a fun movie. It really fell flat. And I said, maybe that's the kind of movie that you got to have a collaborator on. You know, just to top each other with gags. And he said, no, that's not the problem. He said, the problem is that screenwriting is a lost art. I think when I go to the movies, I think that's still true. And I think what you get, there's multiple problems nowadays that have to do with the development process. Of, first of all, of studio films. Too many chefs in the kitchen? Yeah, you have so much pressure for, if you're going to have to spend $100 million on the production and $100 million on marketing, there's so much pressure for it to be successful that it flattens out the storytelling because everybody's like, again, going through this with the animated feature, I dealt with some dramatic irony. And I said, I introduced into the story, the character doesn't realize something's happening here, but the audience does, and it transforms several of the sequences. And I had to keep going to the executive producer and explaining on the whiteboard, okay, this is what the audience knows, this is what they don't know, just to calm them down. Because he was like, is the audience going to get it? Are they going to get it? You know, <laughs> and, and to have a movie like North by Northwest, nowadays, is so tremendously difficult, because to have a movie that alternates between what the audience knows and what's surprised and the different layers of dramatic irony requires someone riding herd on it that can really imagine this, keep it all in their head. And that person at the time was Alfred Hitchcock. Now on a studio picture, it's any number of people. Part of that is the development process. And part of it, I still think there is a lack of knowledge of the craft that you could see in the 40s and the 50s that Frank Danielle was talking about. Filmmaking tends to be, a lot of it is the writing, I think is people kind of learn, they're kind of self-taught a little bit, or they learn a few tricks of the trade and they keep doing that. And they're not aware of all of what's available. Like I say, recapitulation scenes. By the way, I'm raising my hand right now. So, oh, yes. <laughs> as you well, say that, <laughs> things that I don't know, things that I don't know, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, just patterns of even simple details. Here's an example. I recently saw the movie Harvey. I'm thinking, I'm going to spring this on my students. It's from 1950. Have you ever seen that? No. Okay, it's worth it. It's hysterical. It's a blast. Anyway, there's a scene of exposition, and I know that these are craftsmen doing this. It was based on a Broadway play. I haven't read that play. I'm afraid to because the movie's so perfect. I don't want to know what they had to change. One character, it's a comedy, this older woman and her daughter that she's trying to marry off, they live at their older woman's brother's house. Everything was, the older woman's mother left everything for the brother, okay, including the house. So now they got to live there with this eccentric guy. The younger one says, why did your mother have to leave everything to Elwood. The older woman says, well, now you know why she did that, because she died in Elwood's arms, and she was very sentimental about things like that. <laughs> and the daughter says, 
Every time I ask you that, you say the same thing, and it makes no sense because you can't make out a will after you're dead. Okay, there's a little gag, right? This is a problem I run into with my students. This is not, can't be the first time these characters talked about this. It's a mother daughter. They're living with Elwood. The audience needs to learn that, but the characters already know it. So it feels contrived if the characters just say it for the first time. Why did you leave it? Oh, because of this. Instead, they added the little bit, I tell you that every time. And it just tells you they're aware that they have to keep this real. Like this is a relationship. They have to punk the audience into believing that this is a relationship, that these are imaginary characters. They didn't exist before the film started. But you got to make the audience believe they did. And that's one technique to give us a sense that there was a pre-existing life before the movie began. You give clues to that in the way they talk to each other. You don't write it like they've never discussed this before. You write it like they've discussed it 50 times and now you're overhearing it for the first time. Is there a medical condition though that happens when you're in the middle of a script and you're not thinking about anything but the script and time keeps rolling on and you're just immersed in the story? Is there a medical terminology for this yet where you lose <laughs> track of time, you don't know what's going on, etc. I mean, I know you know all about this. Oh, that's wonderful place to be. If the you flow can pull state, that right? The flow state. Yeah, I guess I could call it that. I don't know if it's the technical term. Connie does have, a, she did a a chapter in here on science of imagination. One thing she does say is it sometimes helps to get up and get away from, like you mentioned, step away from it and the answers will come. Yeah, if you can achieve that emotionally being lost in that story, and the way it can sometimes be, and I've heard other people say this, it's like you're not writing it, it's writing itself. You're just writing down what the characters are saying. If you can reach that critical point, that's really great. And I think what that also says, too, is that if somebody, and I'm not saying that I'm there, who knows, I've not been judged too much yet, but I think if you can find yourself in that place, it kind of means that you've come across a vantage of a story or you've come across a story or something that has not yet really been seen by the masses. And then it feels like I need to bring this to people. They need to share in what I've seen because this is rare or it's it's unknown or it's not yet explored. And that's what the driver becomes because you feel like, well, if I don't do it, no one's going to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's like you've discovered this land and you want to bring it back to them. That's wonderful. If you've gotten to that point, that, that's really great. <laughs> we don't know yet. We'll see. Hey, but Paul, listen, I appreciate you taking the time today. Let me rattle off some of the books that people can check out too. The two that I know about, Screenwriting, The Sequence Approach, and The Science of Screenwriting, they can find you at Chapman University, your website, a bunch of articles and links and papers there. Is there any other websites you would like to point people to? Well, my agent would say writesequence.com. Write, W-R-I-T-E, sequence, just like it sounds, all one word, dot com. And that's my site. So I've got like five pages of notes in front of me. So hopefully if you did enjoy this and hopefully you like what it comes out and you like it, hopefully we can do part B at some point in time, because I think it literally of my five pages of notes, we didn't get anywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we scratched the surface. I'd love to. Thank you very much. Yeah, call anytime. Just get in touch and we'll do it again. It's what I love to do. Hey, Paul, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. You're terrific. Uh, you did a great job. Thank you. Take care. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.